Hello, so hello. when you're ready, just uh, introduce yourself. Tell us, tell us who you are. Sure. Hey, uh, my name is Todd Porter. I'm a music supervisor. Um, I have a company called Hated Industries, uh, which is about a year and a half old, plus some change. Uh, my work is mainly with brands. I, I work with advertising agencies. I do work direct for clients. Um, and I do music licensing, but also a lot more than that, um, kind of getting into endorsements, special projects and collaborations, uh, even uh, plotting out festivals for my clients. And um, yeah, that's me. My name is Libby Morris. I am a music producer at an ad agency in Chicago called McGarry Bowen. We have, a, we have other um, partners in New York and also in San Francisco. I'm in the Chicago office. Been there for like four years and we do original music licensing and sound designs for ads for our clients. And I am Michael Carino. I work for Red Light Management, which is the largest independent artist management company in the world. That's a pretty big one, I guess. <laughs> um, I oversee uh, several clients looking after their marketing and branding, uh, what their voice is and their marketing language, their presence in the digital space, and also touching a little bit on sync. And for the purposes of this panel, I'll bring up in a past life, uh, at my last job, I worked for an ad agency in New York where I managed the music business of Taco Bell and their Feed the Beat program, and UGG, uh, their music program as well. Awesome. So uh, let's just give a little bit of a background behind uh, music supervision in advertising, kind of what your role is and, and outline for artists what the details are. Um. From a, just a personal point of view or, or holistically as a career? Holistically as okay. a career, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I started off a young boy. Um, so um, music supervision in, in terms of probably what, uh, what Libby and I do is uh, helping brands uh, with their content, uh, helping them license music that has continuity with what they're producing or who they are as a brand. There's a lot of strategy involved. Uh, a car brand might sound like this, but a beer brand might sound like that. Uh, kind of getting in the weeds with, with that sort of thing. And really it's, uh, it's musical problem solving is what it is. And kind of how it works at our agency and the life of like if a job were coming and you would need music for it, we start with the account team. We get a music terms chart that will say the deliverables for the client, how many spots there are, where the spots are going, how long it will be alive. And then we kind of talk to the creatives and get an idea of what their vision is for this spot, how many tracks do they need. Then based on that knowledge, we go to the broadcast producer, we say how much money we need to do that. They always tell us that they can only give us like $10,000 less than that. And then we try and do the creative problem solving and try and figure out how to get a track that suits best for the spot for the creative's needs and for the client's needs. So, do you have, do you have something to add? I mean, it might be it might be out of turn. I was just going to add that you know, I feel like I come much after the steps that you're talking about. Like once those meetings are happened, once the creative team is pretty aligned with what they're after, then comes the brief process and that brief getting sent out. And uh, red light for for our lane, we have a lot of verticals within our different within our company, and one of those verticals is the people who look after you know music supervision for our artists and they send out the briefs to the, either the people that they feel are appropriate and the songs that they know would work or they're just going to send out like a mass solicitation and it could be as simple as if you have an artist that uses these few keywords this spot is looking for something and we think you might fit in here so typically an artist that's on a publishing agency or a label will have more access to uh, getting their music in advertisement. But if I'm an artist and I haven't signed to a publisher or a label, how would I um, get my music on a commercial? Well, uh, you know, there's there's a, a, a number of methods that I'm going to outline. I, you know, I just want to really quick, because we, we wanted to do this at the start. How many people here are artists? And how many people are labels, publishers? I mean, there you go. Uh, <laughs> good. Well, I'm not talking to you guys. No, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you guys after. Um, I mean, to, to answer your question, how do you, the question is, how do you get your music to music supervisors or yeah. get it licensed? Th there are many different avenues. Um, there are, 
some of the, the most valuable might be, of course, getting your music to people who will amplify your band. Uh, uh, some of these people can be like sync agents, people that specifically represent music for licensing. Um, they are for a music supervisor's trusted friends because when they send us stuff or they send us stuff from, for a brief, we know we can trust it and license it. Um, yeah, you know it's going to be able to be cleared and there won't be any problems with it. You know the right contracts will be in place, mm -hmm. the right insurances will be in place because our company does require a certain level of insurance yeah. to work with you. So. Yeah, I sent a lot of briefs to Terror Bird, um, specifically. They're here. Um, go find them. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, that, that's one thing. I mean, there there's a lot of different ways that we find music. I um, frankly, I find I find a lot of my favorite music through going to shows, trying to see the opener, who I might not know. Um, I probably go and see five hundred plus bands a year, at least. That you know, might be a few more than that. Um, and from that, I, I find things out about bands, not only uh, their music, but also their fans, um, possibly their career trajectory. If they're really good live and they've just blown their, the headliner that night out of the water, I know that they're going someplace and I can bring that back to a client, like uh, I'm working on Jansport right now. It's an active brief that I can tell you guys about. Um, and I go back to them and say, hey, I just saw this band open up for you know, uh, I don't know, uh, any any big headlining act, and they were the first op opening act, and they killed, and they're amazing, and they're young, and their fans are young, and that's why we should work with them. I think another way, too, is networking, as weird as that sounds for being a musician, but just talking to people, seeing if you have a friend that knows someone somewhere, sending, like, going on to advertising um, agencies' websites and sending your stuff, because I can listen to independent artist stuff, and we do have ways around licensing their tracks and someone who will take on those insurances for you. So it's not impossible to do it on your own, but I think it is putting in that extra research to get it in the hands of the right people directly or talking to friends and seeing if they know someone. That is another avenue of getting it heard quicker than like YouTube, Spotify, SoundCloud. A really, a really nice way to get into this is find brands that are relevant for you as an artist. Uh, and see what they're doing, you know? If you really, uh, I was shocked at how many artists, and this is my second year working on Jansport, they all have a Jansport story. Uh, we did a, a, a job, or we did one of our licenses last year with Naked Giants who were playing here, a band I really love and have worked with a number of times. And when it came time to do press, they came forward as a band that had all these Jansport stories and they talked to the press and it was awesome, you know, to, to have that relevance and it was true you know it's it's uh sometimes hard if you get a license and it's for a vehicle or something you're not really connected to it's hard to kind of uh feel feel great about that you know the money and the exposure is nice but it's it's nice to seek out brands that are doing good stuff that you like and two if you do see those spots and you want to find out hey what agency did it uh what production company worked on it there's a great resource out there called iSpot tv that will list all of those credentials for you so you can find it right away. YouTube is kind of touch and go with those credentials, but iSpot TV would have all of them for you normally. Uh, one, one thing I wanted to, I guess, reiterate or, or hit on is the importance of clearing um, what, what goes behind that, because I know sometimes artists can, uh, can skip some steps in copywriting their music, and that, I know that's a big step for, for advertising and brands. <laughs> uh, well, like Todd was saying, we go typically to trusted vendors, so we yeah. trust that they have already done those checks and balances. If we're writing original music, we always put it through to a musicologist to make sure that it isn't infringing on any anyone else's copyright that is existing, so that's something we always do. Most of our contracts say in it, if we're licensing from a music company or a publisher or master, that they do have those certain rights in place, so it's kind of off of our hands should it come back to us. But it, it is really important to know that just you're setting yourself up for failure if you don't have that information out of the gate for yourself. And, and it's important too to, um, I can't stress enough, to, to be ready. You know, if you're, if you're interested in licensing, be ready to actually license because when I get a brief, most of the times things are moving fairly quickly and we make decisions based on, of course, the, the creative, the content, the great song, but also we have to make decisions based on money and based on 
you know, can we license this in time for, you know, shipping the, the product, the content, the spot, whatever it is. So uh, get, if you want to do it, like, make sure you own your own stuff. You're not infringing on anybody else's rights and that anybody else who's involved in the production who might have, say, like, publishing on that has agreed to license, you know, streamline it, make sure that they will uh, be an automatic yes if something comes up. Yeah, the automatic yes, I feel like, is really important with uh, the work we did in Taco Bell. Sometimes there were really the moments where we got the brief to send out and, and we had the people in mind who we wanted and we might have solicited like 10 people and it really might have come down to the first to respond that we knew we were gonna be able to clear quickly because we were operating truly on that quick of a timeline. And you don't always expect that these massive brands are, are gonna operate in this way and you might think that there's more lead up, but <laughs> it really is truly far from the case. Sometimes more, than, more so than like the indies. Sometimes the big brands are really like the quickest to wanna move and if the brief comes your way and you have to find the right song, there really are those moments where you know, the quickest to raise their hand can kind of win that spot and those can be really big wins. So it's good to be ready. So I know that the ad space has been changing quite a bit where um, there's a lot of TV ad space, a lot of commercials, but now we're moving into this online digital space. And uh, I guess, could you elaborate more kind of the, the developments of that arena? We still most of the time start with a TV campaign and then do online videos based off of that campaign. But there are different like social campaigns that our agency does that will license tracks for, I think what needs to catch up is the finances of it. The TV is still top tier of what people are getting because it's still what the most eyeballs are on, but in reality, people are on their phones, on the internet way more, and I think that is something that still we're behind on as an agency, the value of that and the value of online videos. But they are more of the fast and furious kind where like, we, the client found extra money, we're shooting this tomorrow, we need a track in two days, let's do it. They have the least amount of lead time, I would say, the online videos for us. Yeah, and, and to add to that, I think you, you are seeing an awareness now, especially among major labels and publishers. Um, I'd say the majority of the work that I personally do is intended for online. Um, plain old TVC stuff is, is sort of rare now, for me at least. You know, I'm not, I'm not at an agency anymore, but uh, I do a lot of online content and uh, a Sony ATV or a Warner, Warner Atlantic Records know that that is very valuable because they're able to focus that content delivery really specifically to users, you know? Like they're not, they're able to say, okay, you know, we're gonna get this out to older white dudes who play golf and nail it, you know, because those are the guys who are making some kind of decision that they might involve their product. Um, Jansport in particular is really, you know, it's a Gen Z, like, kids in school kind of product, so the work I'm doing is going directly to them, um, and it is focused on media channels that they have, and even though the media might be less expensive, the, the results are probably quite a bit more effective than just splashing out in a TV campaign, so the, it, think about that when you go to license. Um, it's, uh, it's an important part of uh, marketing these days. Awesome. So I guess um, as an artist, there's a lot of different ways to monetize your work, but music supervision or licensing and singing a song seems to be a, a great option um, in several different ways. So I guess elaborate a little bit more on, um, on, on why you enjoy being a music supervisor for advertisement and, and helping artists. I love it from a creative perspective of finding that piece of music that works with the film and that solves a creative ask. It's a, it's a puzzle in a way which I really enjoy because you're doing it based on a client's ask, the creative's ask, and your budget. And then I also just, I love, like ever since I can remember, the way that music moves to film. I think it helps tell the story. Without it, it's, it's nothing. So that, that's why I love it. <laughs> and I love being able to give a voice to a band that might not be on <coughs> tour and play in sold out stadiums, but like those people that really are on the road, like hitting the pavement day after day and just helping them if we can, or even independent artists, composers. It's great working with those people who have so much creative energy and really do care so much about what they're putting out. And I'm very lucky. 
I think uh, for me, it all comes from the, the background of being a music geek, um, also having my father being a musician, not a successful musician, seeing how hard it is to survive as an artist. Um, when, you know, I did, I did probably the most logical trajectory of, you know, kid gets into college, college radio, DJing, product, doing parties, et cetera. Um, then I went and worked on music videos. All my music video guys started making commercials. I started getting into commercials. I went to an agency and found that their use of music was totally fucked. You know, they were, they were ripping off everybody, and including bands that I knew, like people that I knew. And, and at that point, I got to hold up my hand and say, hey, we don't have to copy this. I know these guys, and I know they need a new van, and this is, you know, instead of paying... 40,000 to these guys in a studio who are studio musicians, let's give it to these guys who are going on tour, you know? And, and uh, it started like that, and then I, I, my first really big license was a, um, a license uh, for uh, Brendan Benson, um, and I, was, I really loved this album he put out, and it licensed for quite a bit of money, and, and his label and him, he came back and said, hey, look, you know, I don't know if you realize it, but we never made a dollar off that record because we we're still re recouping costs. It was a very expensive album to make. You paid off all the costs it's two years after the album came out. We made money on top of that, and then the album started selling again, and we were able to go back on tour. And at that point, I was like, I'm done. This is exactly what I want to do for the rest of my life. And uh, so it is. it comes from a, you know, a, a DJ fun with music, like sorting out what people want to hear to motivate them to dance or whatever but then also an artist support thing and a really like cool position to be in, you know, exciting for, for a music geek like me. Yeah, and just to chime in kind of from the, the artist and the artist marketing POV, I think it's, it's really exciting when you can see these, these moments really ladder into a tentpole of a campaign. I think, you know, every day there's more noise than ever before. Everybody's making noise and everybody's fighting for it. So anything that you can have that really adds to that and can really add to your footprint, whether it is through digital content, whether it's through a TV spot, I think they're all you know, really important because they do ladder into things like people going back to DSPs and listening to songs and, and kind of growing your, your count in that way, people checking out socials, like all of those little incremental moments can kind of, uh, can kind of snowball into, into a really big thing. And as a total aside from that, uh, I'll add that, you know, Working on Taco Bell, I actually came from the life of touring with DIY punk bands and being on the receiving end of the Feed the Beat program. And you know, if you're not familiar with Feed the Beat, it kind of starts out the program by they send you $500 in Feed the Beat gift cards. And for a developing artist to get money on the road, and this isn't a sell, like I don't, it's, but for, for a developing artist on the road, like that money can be really helpful. And then you learn things like, oh, when they're going to pull a sync for a commercial or for social content, for Snapchat, whatever it may be, they're only pulling from the pool of Feed the Beat artists. Like, that's really important. So you feel like you're part of this family. So then to go to the other side, you know, I, that was something that always really made me feel really impassioned was to go and actually work and give these opportunities back to the artists. That was something that, you know, really got me excited and really saw the change that this can make in an artist's career, whether you are just a developing artist who's starting out or whether you're a career artist who's on your eighth album and, and landing a massive sync campaign that, that covers all areas. I think it's just, it's really exciting to watch what all of that can ladder into. As a, as a music supervisor, one of my sort of favorite things was to go and see the impact of a sync we'd done or a performance, you know, a stage thing with an artist and be able to talk to, you know, people at Shazam and see how much, how many times the, the piece had been Shazammed or of course, you know, direct sales, you know, starting from the point where the, the content dropped and it's really cool. It, it makes a difference. I, I know the work that, you know, that we, we do sells millions and millions of singles and now it's, I guess streams, it's a little confusing as to what the impact is there, but, uh, or <laughs> how it helps anyone. Um, but, uh, but it is, you know, it's it's always uh, a very cool thing when you can go back and kind of graph out, like, okay, it happened here, and then boom, you know, number one on Billboard or whatever. Cool. Well, I'd like to open it up a little bit just for a little bit of a discussion, um, so we can start uh, gathering some questions from artists and maybe even some some publishing. So, if you have a question, just raise your hand, and we'll pass the mic to you. Anybody? Yeah. 
Um, so from an artist's perspective, you talked about sync agents a little bit, um, a developing artist, I guess, and getting music in front of sync agents, or, I mean, assuming that they are kind of the, uh, maybe the gatekeepers, or, um, and then you talked about uh, in-house music production and kind of custom stuff. Do you do any of that with like um, contract work out of house or in house and just kind of like ways to get your foot in the door, I guess? All I do is out of house. We don't have anyone at McGarry Bowen that is a musician or a composer or anything. Um, but yeah, an another side to this are music houses who work with original um, composers who write music for licensing. And that could be a musician who has a band and does it on the side. That could be someone who is just an orchestral composer. But they, too, would structure a deal with you. If you were to have a catalog of tracks that you were looking to get out there into the sync world, they would structure a deal with you similar to like a publisher or a label. And that's a, a really great other avenue of uh, income for many artists, big artists. I used to get uh, demos from Safian Stevens, uh, all the guys in Pinback, like um, there's a lot of people who are doing this and it uh, it's cool because number one, the paychecks can, can really hit when you get something big and it keeps going, but also you're developing a, a catalog of your own work that will stick around and you might be able to, uh, number one, just keep shopping around and getting it licensed. You might be able to sell it to another catalog as they build up their stuff. Uh, the the world of, of catalog music right now is kind of exciting. I mean, there's really great music that's out there that's in catalog. Um, I spent pretty much the start of my career fighting against using catalog music and, and going to work with you know real living, breathing indie bands that were on the road. Um, but, but now those bands have gotten hip to this and are making great stuff and have hundreds of songs. Um, you've got, you know, Terror Bird's doing work in this this realm. There's Marmoset and a few others that are that have good quality stuff. Did that, did that answer kind of your question? Yeah. Cool. Do you have any other questions? Yeah. Uh, hello. I recently saw an ad that was very targeted to me. It was a uh, like car seat headrest song. I'm 25, and I was like, okay, yeah, I live in <laughs> Seattle. This is pretty obvious. Um, but I'm wondering if it's a different process for you working with somebody with like a built uh, cult following like that, and if any advertisers kind of come to you asking for that. Absolutely. Definitely, yes. Yeah, yeah, and for better or for worse, I've destroyed some songs that people really love. <laughs> And I mean, like, <laughs> holy shit, the backlash was visceral. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, you know, it, it's I, one of the things that I've done for years, I, I do showcases with artists a lot. And, and part of that is a talk that I like to call We're Not Monsters. And uh, you find out as you get into agencies or even these big clients, there's a lot of people that just really fucking love music. And they have their taste in music and you will get served up very interesting options, you know, because they really love that artist and they want to work with them. Um, and sometimes it is about, you know, getting closer to to that core demographic, but sometimes it can just be, I really love this particular band. And think it would pair well with their brand and get them more eyeballs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> sometimes it's not, though. It's very strange. Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, from your perspective, do you have to, like, kind of set boundaries there as well? Um, like not ruining that song for people. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was uh, the 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 thing I mentioned, and I'll call it out, but I won't say the client. They they did a uh, a version of "Walk on the Wild Side," Lou Reed's track, and I got to work with Lou Reed, and we recreated the track because there was no instrumental, and it was fantastic. It was the most beautiful, like bright, shiny, like soulful version of it I could imagine. I listened to it and I fucking cried. It was so good. And then I got the lyrics and I was like, don't do this. <laughs> don't do this, don't do this. And I, and I tried to uh, angle it like, you know, instead of having, you know, kind of mumbly voiceover guy do it, let's get Q-tip to do it because then it gives it a, another kind of provenance and it brings it away from a song that really, you know, so many people identify with their own 
journey in life, you know, like there's, there's people that definitely listen to that song and then just said, fuck it, I'm going to be who I am, you know? Um, and then they, yeah, they released it and instantly people were like, fuck you. Like it was talking about printing stuff and getting on the internet to that too. And it was just stomach aches. <laughs> it's on my reel. <laughs> I put it there as a cautionary example. Um, I work in advertising on the creative side at a pretty small agency, but we work with some bigger clients. And I'm also a musician. And the culture of music licensing at my agency is like the cheapest you can find. Yeah. And as a creative, I've really wanted to try to like foster that culture of like, I have so many musician friends that would, you know, sell you a track for, you know, a very affordable amount, and it would be a huge thing yeah. for them. And I guess, do you have any tips of like how I can continue to push that with our clients and within my agency? For me, I hear you. <laughs> I hear you loud and clear. I think it, we kind of talked about this earlier, I think it is a lot about educating them in a way that like maybe it's not going to be on the job you're talking to them, but in conversation, if you're in a meeting or something, it's it stems from the broadcast producers and the account team and them relaying to the client the importance and until they believe it yeah. too, it's, it's going to be really hard to get over that hump. So I think the more open conversations you're having, like even this one about it, the better. And saying like there are more cost effective options than stock music out there that might be a little more expensive, but like look at what you're getting. You're getting a tailored track made for you, tailored to your campaign or a track from an up and coming artist that is gonna be something and you have that to also hang your hat on as a brand. I think it, it is just having those difficult conversations and I, I hear you, so yeah. Yeah, I always try to argue for the, for the de deeper relationship, the, the more curated content, you know, we could, yeah, we could grab this, you know, stock music track that's just a series of, of numbers and letters or we can grab this track from a band who played here last week or a band that is, going to do something, some a band that might identify with the brand, and it kind of makes them brand ambassadors, and it also might amplify the message. I would just say from the artist perspective, you know, you can think about the size of the brand and maybe the relation of the deal to that, and maybe it doesn't seem fair, maybe it's a billion dollar brand, but the, the amount for the sync is pretty small. I think that there are these moments where, you know, this can be a paycheck, but there are the moments where it goes deeper and you have to think about what it can do for you, what it might lead into. If it's something that feels really authentic, if it's something that you align with, if it's a brand that you feel a sense of loyalty for, then sometimes those financial things can, can be a little bit of a wash because it's going to ladder into something much bigger for you. Um, I've licensed music with uh, Marmoset and I was really fascinated by seeing, um, you know, some artists kind of just basically creating a separate identity to create catalog music. And it seems like uh, a great venue for artists trying to find passive income. Um, would it be a good idea? Because, like, w we're looking for f 10 seconds or 20 seconds, and then we have these full songs. And we're like, we only need, like, this little part of a song. Would it be a good idea for an artist to create you know, 20 different 10 second clips rather than, you know, putting together a whole single for, you know, trying to do catalog music. And what's the strategy for that, maybe for somebody breaking into that kind of work? 10 seconds is short. Okay. Most, yeah, <laughs> most, most commercials are 60 to 30 for broadcast TV. And then you have like the long forms for web. I would say if you're trying to get um, quantity, I would start with 60 seconds as your as your smallest track that you're writing, and then knowing that maybe the client might want to extend it to a minute 30, being able to be able to offer that as a resource if they love that track but they need 30 more seconds. I think, but if you're trying to write more, I would I would start at 60 seconds because two sometimes they'll want to pull like the last 30 seconds of your track or 20 seconds, you, it is really great to have that buffer because so many times I've sent 30 second tracks and I'm like, is there any more to this? Does it go anywhere? And it, it is just helpful to have more. Yeah, I, I'd say, you know, kind of on that, you can, you can look at your tracks and be able to sort of shorten them into just the, the bones, you know, like what I look for when I, when I start screening stuff is an intro that'll get us into the content, step up, it's a really like logical arc 
uh, and then you see it everywhere from a scene in a movie to a commercial. Um, you can distill things down to that. I would not worry about going too long. I would worry like if it's the 30 second thing because I get it, I'm like this is great and I don't know whether there's a longer part of the song. So 90 seconds longer, it's fine for people like us. Is that everything? Okay. <laughs> oh, do we have Yeah. yeah. Please. All the way back. All the way back. Props on the Maroon Brewing Company shirt, by the way. Yeah. It's good stuff. Uh, Michael, you mentioned V and V or B and B. I couldn't quite hear what you had said about that. Um, and then, how would an artist get into that? Ooh, I don't even remember what I said. It, it was, was really powerful. <laughs> when you were doing DIY in your out oh, on the road? I was just talking about, you know, like what it was, I think it was around what impassioned us. And I think I was talking about, you know, before I got into agency work, I was working for Taco Bell. Um, and whenever I was working for Taco Bell, I was on the receiving end of the agency work that they were doing. And uh, seeing that that was a big brand, truly a bill, Yum Media is a billion dollar brand, and seeing that they were doing something that was taking care of, that to me felt like they were taking care of little developing talent bands on the road, and asking nothing for it in return, whereas a lot of these, you know, it's not an influencer program, it's nothing. They're like, here's money, welcome to this family. You don't have to do anything for us. You never have to talk about it on social media, you have to, don't have to do anything. So I think that's where I was just getting with uh, what impassioned me about uh, about this world and, and getting into it was seeing that there can be these these situations where you know when I was 16 to 20 touring in bands I I love Taco Bell so to, to, <laughs> to food to, of the gods <laughs> to to, yeah. uh, to be able to like feel like this this brand was paying attention to a band that had like in the lower thousands of fans on social media for example like it felt really it felt important and uh I think that kind of ladders into what I, what I said most recently with like in closing, you know, Taco Bell was always, when they were doing syncs, was always try to take care of a band fiscally, but sometimes the money just wasn't there. Sometimes the spot just didn't have the budget that was gonna allow for it. But if you do feel an affinity, and that's kind of how the role that we had to take as the agency, we were like, it goes deeper than this. We realized that this paycheck might not be what you expect, but like, we're gonna take care of you at some point, or this, you know, there's a track history of like this brand, bringing this to the table once a sync happens. So I think, you know, from the agency point of view, it's kind of about being a really good salesman because sometimes the money isn't really there and it's really unfortunate. You know, even thinking about programming events and, and programming South by Southwest when you're, when you're, or any music festival tree for it, you know, sometimes you want to have a footprint and it's really expensive and you, you want to do right by the artist, but the money isn't always there and you're gonna pay them, but it's not necessarily what you would maybe as an artist want from a billion dollar brand, but they're gonna take care of you in the long run. And, and I'm speaking about Taco Bell just because that's what I'm close to and I worked really closely on it for a while even though I don't even work there anymore. Yeah. But I think that this goes so far beyond Taco Bell. I'm just speaking about that from my experience. There are brands that you know, if you align with them, I think they're gonna do right by you. And as an artist, I think it's on you to identify what those brands are, figure yeah. out if there are goal people that you want to work with, that you would love to have your music associated with, and then start to do the things like you talked about going to iSpot TV, figuring out the moves that you have to make to align with these partners, mm -hmm. you know, whatever the brand might be, whatever yeah. it might be, whether you just want to start getting involved in more digital content, you know, you can start making those moves without having anybody representing you, without having a manager, without having anything. It's going to be a lot more difficult, but you can start to make those moves towards growing towards that. Yeah, I would say, you know, on that tip too, you can you can look and see who's doing work like this and it's not that hard to, to join in with some of these programs. Like there's, uh, I think there's several different beer, you know, brewer breweries that are doing music programs. Uh, Lagunitas, um, I'm trying to remember the others, but they're doing concert series. Um, uh, New Belgium. Goose Island as well. Goose Island, yep. yeah, doing concert series. They're doing special programming things with NPR. Um, it's really an interesting environment. I, I did some work like the Feed the Beat thing for Doritos uh, stages and that kind of thing. And it was, you know, it was, it was deeper than just show up and play. You know, we, we licensed their music. I, I did a recap video one year and I'd always license a band that played the stages that year. And it, the recap video ran on YouTube for six days and they sold 100,000 singles of the song we used from start to end. So it can be good. More questions? 
I guess this question, maybe more towards Todd and Libby, I was interested in what it looks like for you guys to create your network more. So like who, who are these brands that you are, you know, going to be pitching an artist to or music to? What does it look like to try to develop these relationships with those brands? Um, yeah, and I guess you could weigh in a little bit in terms of how you would gear an artist at red light management to like be something that these guys would want to try to get a brand on. Well, brand wise for me, it's just what our agency has, our agency clients. So I just work on what the Chicago agency has in their pocket brand wise with who I work with. A lot of that has to do with budget, and then secondly, the budget is creative ask, and then kind of based on what we get back from that, or original music, who the creatives want to work with based on like a reel for original music, and then that's how I pick my partners, and how I meet them is through email, phone conversations, shows, and then you just kind of develop those relationships, so if someone wants uh, an orchestral track, I know which music house I would go to there for that. If someone wanted like an indie pop artist that's like up and coming, I know who I would go to there. So it's, the, it's just over time developing those relationships. But brand wise, I am with just the brands of my agency that we have as clients. Um, so I, being an independent now, um, I worked in an agency for many, many years. I worked at an agency in San Francisco called Goodby Silverstein and Partners. And the beauty of working there was that it's kind of a finishing school. Um, most of the lead creatives at agencies across the world have worked at that agency at one time, so I have a very good network of people. Um, I also have brands that I keep working with. In the past year, I uh, worked on Jansport, Levi's, um, some startup stuff for Smug Mug, which is now, uh, they bought Flickr. Uh, I did Aetna Insurance based on past work. I've done a number of Aetna campaigns and Old Navy too. Um, a, lot of, a lot of clothing. I don't know how that happened, but it's where I'm at these days. Um, and it, you know, as an independent, it, it really is, uh, you know, let's just see what comes through the door. And I've been lucky enough to have some, some really cool, fun projects, you know, so happy about it. Yeah, and I guess on the artist side, um it can kind of fall two ways. Uh, and you mentioned, you know, being served an ad for with car seat headrest involved or wh whatever it was. I think the, uh, sometimes a creative is going to have that very clear vision and they might just go direct to the artist team, management label, whatever it might be and be like, is this band, would this, would this spot work? Like, is this, here's the brief, is this something we can make work? Because they might even already have a cut of the spot with the song in it and be like, this is like what we're looking for. They just they have the song they they want to use it like can we make this work, and then that's a you know the conversation trails on or it might just fall in the way of we're receiving the briefs just the same way of anywhere else like there's there's really very real examples where we'll get a, an email in our inbox and it's looking for music that involves two or three keywords and sometimes we even really do have to like go through our artist catalog of music and be like is is the word water in any of these songs like can we can we figure this out and and it can fall in those two directions the words are revolution brand new day new beginning go <laughs> family what do you got feeling good together <laughs> friendship <laughs> Are there, the are there any common themes that, that you see, like trends or anything like that with, with wording or sounds? My trends, stance, my trends stem from brands. Like we have certain brands that have pinpointable sounds. You know the tracks they're gonna choose, you know the music houses that keep nailing it or the artists that they like. And then there's also that trend for, like we were talking about it earlier, for briefs that they're like, we need things like this, or we like this track, and Portugal you... The man. Portugal the man, Portugal the man, and Portugal the man. <laughs> and glass animals, yeah. Sylvan yeah. S.O. Yeah. And then that, you hear that over and over and over. Ev so. Every music search for the past two years has eventually landed on I Feel It Still by Portugal the Man. And yeah. I have a whole folder of I Feel It Still by Portugal <laughs> the Man that is not Portugal the Man.
Um, on the topic of lyrics, I guess, a little bit, I was curious about instrumental music and that role, and then also if you could speak a little bit towards uh, licensing side and ownership of tracks. I, I know some catalog stuff, it's more like they buy it from you and then they own it for um, a free use or whatever versus just getting something to, I mean, royalty or whatever. Yeah, real, real quick from the artist side, one thing I would, I would say is, you know, it might seem obvious to make sure that when you're going through the album process and you're working with your engineer and your mastering engineer to, to get the final product to ask for the instrumental stems, but not everybody does that, and it's a really important thing. And to speak back to earlier when I said sometimes it's just the first person to raise their hand, if, if you get approached and a brand is moving quickly for whatever the project might be, and you're like, oh, well, actually, I, have to, I would have to go back to the engineer, but wait, the engineer's on vacation right now. I don't think I will be able to get these to you in a week. Is that okay? And they might have been the perfect fit for the spot, but if that's not going to work, it's just not going to work with the timeline, and we, you might have to move on. And I think that just really all hones back to, to being ready. So I, I, I don't know if you were talking more about instrumental music, but I, to just talk about making sure that you have instrumentals of your own tracks, I think is just always, so important. Always. Yeah, make an instrumental and actually spend time to mix it and make sure it sounds as good as the full mix. Because I, I get that a lot too, where I request the instrumental and it it's garbage. And I, I, know I need to take the instrumental into the studio to make it sound like the other because when we get an instrumental usually what we're using it for is to duck out a lyric or line or help us to make a transition it's it's just nuts and bolts technical stuff um but we always need the instrumental like there are, there will always be some sort of dialogue or something else that that we can't have lyrics over and i would say for me just in the last couple of years i would license probably eight instrumental and two lyrical. We, the majority of what we're licensing are instrumentals. So to both of their points, if, even if you have a really cool lyrical track, having an instrumental of it is always helpful. And like he said, like you are, you're looking for a key phrase sometimes from brands, so the rest of the lyrics aren't useful for the spot and you do need that to kind of work with and edit with. And then on the ownership question, I mean, I, I think artists should try to retain ownership of their stuff. Uh, yeah. Maybe do it as a license instead of a full-on buyout. Uh, you know, it depends on the money they're offering. Um, keep your writer share, your PRO rights, because that is mailbox money. It's not yeah. a lot, but but it can turn into something if it really gets picked up on something big. Um, and yeah, I mean, again, I, I see more and more artists doing catalog and other content as um, you know a, a really decent second gig but also some money in the bank or an investment in the future when they might not be you know producing music as a band anymore so and I would always try and also do non-exclusive with whoever you're giving your stuff to as well and they are each company is going to structure their deals differently but if you can retain 50 percent of the publishing your whole writer share if you can retain all of the publishing and just do a sync percentage I think those are better than just giving it all, like, here's my track, here's your money, and they have it forever and ever. I, I think you're not doing yourself, you're doing yourself a disservice by doing that, I think. Hi, uh, I just wanted to go back to working with artists. Do you find that there's still a stigma against selling out? Or like in a post iPod commercial world, are they sort of excited to be on board? I think if it's authentic, no. I think if you, I think that there can be some of that. I think that sometimes there might have to be really real conversations with, between an artist and the greater team surrounding it of if it makes sense and from what points of view it makes sense. And it can feel that way. And you know, at the end of the day, you're talking about you know this this monetary exchange for art to push a product that ultimately isn't your product. And and there can be some stigma around that. But I think if it I think if it's something that you feel good about as an artist, and if it's, you know, that's a perfect world, but if it's something that you can align with in certain ways, if it's something that doesn't do a disservice to the message that you're trying to spread with your music or with your art, then I don't think it really matters. I think as long as there's nothing that you're just gonna feel really gross about, then fine. If there's something that is a little gross to it, have the conversation and figure out, like, does this work for us or does this not work for us? There's, a, there's an interesting other point of view on this in, in that, 
you know, if you are a Portugal the man or, or before them, Black Keys, if you don't license, they're going to find something to replace it with that sounds like you because that's their mindset. You know, not necessarily full-blown rip you off, although in some cases definitely full-blown rip you off. Um, so sometimes taking the money is what you should do. There's a, there's a really good story, and you can find it on the internet someplace, about specifically about Black Keys and licensing because they were getting hit to license all the time, and they were saying, no, 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 And I think they sat down with their parents, and their parents were like, you could have bought, like the house you're sitting in, you could have bought it three times, and then you look at what they went and did anyway, and it's a similar sound. You know, I, I will never forget, that was the first time I saw all of a sudden artists popping up all over the place. Like legit artists, but they just had that sound. That's what they were going for. And I worked with them a lot, you know. Um, uh, there, there will be a response to a need, you know, and, and if you can be there and take advantage of it and, you know, make sure it's relevant to what you're doing, you know, don't go and advertise weapons or something. Yeah, uh, if you're not aligned with the yeah, brand's yeah. message. Yeah, no. yeah. Um, but but it, by all means, if it, if it works and it's not going to, uh, you know, keep you up at night, go for it, you know. I, I don't think the stigma is there for, for most kinds of music anyway. Um, what kind of advice would you give to an artist who's maybe signed already to somebody like Terrorbird but wants to get into that side hustle mm -hmm. of uh, writing specific music for like uh, bids for campaigns, for example? Um, choosing which music houses to approach or how to approach them, that kind of stuff. I mean, I, I think that's that's the first step is is to get involved with a music house that's doing good work, you know, that has. Um, other good composers, but but not so many that you'll get buried. Yeah. Um, you can learn a lot. You know, you learn about the process and how it works. You can also have a chance at making money. Um, and again, you know, depending on what your deal with them is, you are generating music that can be used for other things. I um, I think back in the day, it's it's a little different now. Back in the day, the first thing I would do when I had a campaign that didn't have a lot of money and was moving quickly is I wouldn't call a catalog. I'd call a music house that had great composers and say, send me all your dead demos, things that didn't license, because I know you have something that sounds like the Black Keys. No, if you, you have something that, that would be relevant for what we're doing, um, and they would send me stuff, and it was much, at that time, much better than catalog. A lot has changed. Catalog stuff now is really good, because those people have now, the music houses, labels, other people have realized that this is a good, solid source of income, so they, they all have really good catalog material. Yeah, I would just first make sure it doesn't infringe on any contracts you've signed. <laughs> and then, yeah. and then, yeah, research, like look at spots, look at things they've composed, spots they've produced, and if you like their work and if it aligns with your way of thinking or your way of writing, then yeah, just I would, there, most of the time, most music houses have their contact information on their website. So if you see an ad you like on TV, oh, I wonder who did that, you find that out, you can just email and submit and tell them you're looking for it. And if and if they like your tracks and if you guys get along and if you can connect on a deal, like I, it, it is a great resource and they are every year continually getting better and better and more robust. Anyone else? Anyone else? Okay. So I wanted to give a little bit of a plug actually because um, we're gonna be holding another music supervision panel um, on Saturday, and I know that it's tough as an artist to get in front of music supervisors, so like this is a great chance to really get in front of music supervisors, and um, I've sent out some briefs, and so you're able to submit songs to those briefs, and supervisors will listen to them, and it's, um, it's an educational panel, but also, I mean, for example, um, Todd's working on a Jansport commercial, and he came out to Treefort because he needs to license some tracks. About ten Jansport commercials. So yeah, it's a, he has lot ten. Of, and, and very, you know, the, the whole thing is about varying genres, and you know, it's really specifically targeted towards Gen Z, you know, kids. But uh, it's, uh, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of needs for content. Yeah, yeah. So if you are an artist and you want to get your music in front of some supervisors, you can meet me afterwards, and I'd, I'd love to you know, walk you through how you can submit that music, because um, this is really why, why we hold these panels, is to, is to help artists build a career and, and learn different ways that they can monetize work and, and get out there, so, yeah. Um, 
I, I don't have anything else unless you guys want to expand on, on anything, but. Who are you guys gonna see tonight? <laughs> Cherry Glazer. Naked Giants is playing uh, in a couple minutes over at the uh, pre funk. I'm gonna go see oh, those guys. Right. Yeah. They're they're awesome. Yeah. There we go. Cool. Yeah, cool. Well thank you so much for coming out. I'm glad that we had such a good turnout. If you wanna stick uh, s hang out afterwards, there's some coffee and, and things like that. So um, stick around. Thanks again. Thanks everybody. Thanks. Thank you.